In this video, we're going to look at graphing the common trigonometric functions. Remember that earlier we've generated tables of cosine values for various angles. So for example, some are shown here. We have that when theta is zero, cos of theta is one. When theta is 30, cos of theta is approximately 0.9. And so on for all these other angles, all the way up to 360. If we plot these coordinate pairs, as points on the Cartesian plane, as you can see, and then join them with a smooth curve, we're starting to get a picture of what the graph of the cosine function looks like. Well, it turns out that if you allow theta to be an independent variable and vary it continuously over some domain, you can generate a trigonometric function. We can do this for all of the trig functions. In fact, here's a really useful link that you might want to follow. Uh, and we can check that out now. This particular site has some really useful stuff for pre-calculus study. Uh, but this one I really like, and that's an animation of the sine function and the unit circle. So you can see this, imagine the angle in here, the blue angle, changing all the way from 0, 90, 180, 270, and up to 360. And as it does, we're tracing out this value, which is the height of that red point. Because on the unit circle, sine of t, or sine of the angle, is equal to the y coordinate there. And there's a bunch of others there as well that you can check out, and I encourage you to do that. So let's complicate it a little. What we actually want to get towards is graphing a constant a multiplied by sine of b times theta. Let's have a look at sine of theta. So I'm going to choose some points for the function y equals sine theta. In this case, the a and the b up here are just equal to 1. So we could get this table of coordinate pairs, 0 and 0, 45 and 0 0.707, and so on. And you can see those plotted here on the Cartesian plane. And you can see, again, this kind of sinusoidal shaped curve. Funnily enough, that might be where the name comes from. If we can extend the domain a little bit and look at many more values, we get a graph that looks like this one. And that same shape is repeating itself over and over and over again. Well, it turns out that that's what happens for graphs of sine of theta and cos theta as well. Even if we multiply them by a number out the front, and even if we multiply theta by a number inside, all that's going to happen by changing those numbers is that the graph will be stretched vertically or squished, or possibly squished and stretched horizontally. So that number that sits out the front of A sine B theta, that A number, its absolute value is called the amplitude of the function. And what it does is it modifies the maximum and minimum values of the function. So if you remember, the sine curve that we drew on the previous slide looked like this. If we multiplied that sine theta by 2, 2 sine theta, we get the curve on the left here. Exactly the same shape, but as you can see, it's stretched vertically so that it now goes from minus 2 to positive 2 instead of minus 1 to positive 1. On the other hand, if we multiply by 1 half, we get a squished curve this curve only ever reaching one half positive in the vertical direction and negative a half. So you can see that that multiplier that sits out the front of sine, which would have started as a one, could be a two or a half or any other number that you like really, simply squishes and stretches the graph vertically. On the other hand, the value of B, this number inside here multiplying by theta the angle, it alters how often the graph of the trig function cycles. So in other words, how rapidly it repeats itself. When we say that the period, often denoted with a capital T, of the function, in other words, the length over which the function repeats itself, is given by this formula here, t equal to 2 pi divided by b. So again, if we start with the regular y equals sine theta curve shown in the middle picture, you can see that it repeats its shape every two pi spaces along the x-axis. 
if we multiply theta by 2, like this, we see the curve here on the left. And you can see that it's squished it up so that it's actually doing two cycles in that same amount of space. So here over a length of 2 pi, we can see two full sine waves, whereas over here, in a length of 2 pi, we only had one sine curve. So it's multiplied its frequency by 2, or the period, by a half. On the other hand, if we multiply theta by 1 half, as we have in the third curve over here on the right, you can see that the wave is stretched out further. So we're only getting one full sine curve over a space of not 2 pi like in the middle, but 4 pi. And again, all of this can be read through calculating the value of capital T. As I mentioned earlier, the shape of the sine curve is shared by the cosine curve. The two functions are simply shifted sideways along the horizontal axis. So if you look at the, the picture down here, we see that sine theta, which is the dotted line, and cosine theta, the solid line, when we show them re repeated over this much longer domain of minus 4 pi to 4 pi, you can see that the shape is identically the same. The only difference is that the cosine curve is shifted slightly along the axis compared with the sine curve. But their heights are the same, in other words their amplitude, and the frequency, or the period over which they repeat themselves, is also the same. So in summary, for the graphs of the functions y equal to a sine b theta and y equal to a cos b theta, we have that the quantity absolute value of a is the amplitude of the function, and it alters the height and depth of the function. b, on the other hand, changes the period, capital T, of the function. That's the length of the, along the theta axis, or the horizontal axis, taken to complete one full cycle of the curve. And the period is determined by the formula t equal to 2 pi over b. So let's look at sketching one of these things ourselves. Say we wanted to graph y equal to a sine b theta, or y equal to a cos b theta. We need to do the following things. First of all, the way I always set these up is to just draw a generic sine curve. I don't identify any of the values anywhere, or where it crosses the axis. In other words, I just draw a sine curve. Something like this. On top of that, then, we can place the axes in the appropriate position for either a cosine or a sine curve. The first thing you can do is draw the horizontal axis. So we can just slot that straight through the middle, like this. We're using theta here, so we'll call that the theta axis. Now the cosine function, we know when theta is 0, cosine is 1. So if we were drawing a cosine function, we might draw our vertical axis here, so that it crosses through in the correct place. On the other hand, for a sine function, we know that sine of 0 is equal to 0. So I'd want to draw my vertical axis something like this. Now I need to look at the amplitude of the function. In both of these cases, we've just got the generic a value. So assuming that a is positive, I can put a up here and minus a down here. If a was 10, for example, the curve would go as high as 10 and as low as minus 10. So I just put 10 and minus 10. Then we need to calculate the period, t equal to 2 pi over b, and label the horizontal intercepts. In this case, again, it's completely general. So I could put right here, 2 pi over b, and back here, minus 2 pi over b. And in between, half of those, minus pi on b and pi on b. But that's all very general. Let's have a look at some specific examples. In A, we're asked to sketch the graph of y equal to sine theta. Well, this is probably the easiest one that you'll be asked to do. Again, following my instructions, draw yourself a sine-shaped curve. Then put in the horizontal axis. Our variable is theta. And we've got sine of theta. So we know that the vertical axis must go through here so that sine will be 0 when theta is 0. 
the amplitude is 1 because we've got 1 times sine theta. So I can label the vertical axis as 1 and minus 1. B is equal to 1 as well, so T is equal to 2 pi over 1, or just 2 pi. So I know a full cycle of my graph is going to finish up at 2 pi, and back here at minus 2 pi. And then I can label in the other intercepts as well. 0, half of 2 pi is pi, and half of minus 2 pi is minus pi. And that's our curve of y equal to sine theta. Okay, pause the video now and have a go at B and C yourself. Okay, for y equal to 2 cos theta, that's part B. Again, we start by drawing the regular shape of the curve and put in a couple of lengths. Then we want a horizontal axis. Again, it's the theta variable. The vertical axis this time, because it's a cosine function, needs to go right here so that when theta is zero, we have cosine at its maximum value. Now we need the amplitude, in this case two, so I can label the vertical axis, two and minus two. Then again, because b is one, we have t equal to two pi over one, or just two pi, so I can label in my horizontal axes as well. But remember, with the cosine function, it's not going to end at 2 pi because it's actually started back here one quarter of its full length backwards. So one quarter of 2 pi will be minus pi on 2. So this one here is going to be pi on 2. And here, 3 pi on 2. So in between there we have pi. Back this way, minus pi, minus 3 pi on 2, minus 2 pi and so on. So there we have our graph of 2 cos theta. Part C, we have y equal to sine of pi theta. Well, again, I'm just going to start it the same way, drawing in a sine curve, putting in the horizontal axis. Again, the variable is theta, so I can label that as the theta axis. We have a sine curve, so I put my vertical axis passing through so that sine of 0 is 0. Out the front, we've got a 1 there, 1 times sine pi theta, so the amplitude is 1, and I can label my vertical axes, axis. There's a pi in here multiplying by theta, though, so b is equal to pi means that t is equal to 2 pi divided by pi, or 2. So that means we get a full cycle of the sine curve over a length of 2. So that's the final thing I can label is my horizontal axis, full length at 2, so a half length at minus 1, and so on. And of course, remember, I'm only just drawing this. It doesn't really stop. It keeps going forever, repeating itself over and over again. So there we go. In this video, we have seen the shape of the standard sine and cosine curves. And we've also seen one method by which you can sketch the graph of trig functions of the form a sine bx and a cos bx.